Welcome back to DLS 105, Risk Tools and Calculations for Risk Assessments. This is Module 2, Calculating and Portraying Risk. After completing this module, course participants should be able to demonstrate how to perform the basic calculations for quantitative dam and levy risk assessments. This presentation will start with a discussion of interpolation and extrapolation considerations for risk assessments. From there, we will define the different types of risks associated with dams and levees, then move on to how to calculate and portray these risks. Lastly, we will discuss how to calculate the annual probability of inundation, which is used for the National Flood Insurance Program accreditation evaluation during levy risk assessments. Let's start by covering interpolation and extrapolation. To start, why do we even need to interpolate or extrapolate? When we are evaluating the performance of our infrastructure and are estimating system response probabilities, we will typically only evaluate four or five discrete hazard points. We will then interpolate to calculate probabilities between those discrete points and use those interpolated probabilities as inputs in an event tree. There are several interpolation options that are available. We want to choose the method that best approximates a straight line. This is known as linearization, and because we use linear interpolation formulas, linearization makes the interpolation calculation more accurate. When a team elicitation is completed, one of the first things we do is plot the system response to look at it and make sure the shape and probabilities are reasonable. But we're also trying to decide which transformation best creates a straight line. We typically do this by visual inspection, but also consider the R squared value for our data. R squared is a coefficient of determination and is a measure that provides the goodness of fit of a model. The closer the R squared value is to one, the better the fit. The three most used methods of interpolation are linear, logarithmic, and z-variate. Z-variate or logarithmic interpolation are usually appropriate for frequencies, exceedance probabilities, inflow, outflow, and system response probabilities. However, we must be careful with system response probabilities because sometimes they're zero and you cannot take the log or z of zero. A simple workaround is whenever you have an instance where your system response probability is equal to zero and you want to use logarithmic or z-variate interpolation, change that system response probability to something very small, like one times 10 to the minus 20, and then evaluate a stage or a hazard near that zero threshold. Linear interpolation is usually appropriate for stage, ground motions, and system response probabilities for overtopping failure modes. Microsoft Excel provides a forecast function that can be used for linear interpolation, but the RMC did them one better and developed a very useful macro with the typical interpolation functions. The macro is preloaded into most of the spreadsheets for this course, but you can also download it from the course website so that you can use it with other spreadsheets. Later in this presentation, we will cover the macro in more detail and how to use it. Here's an example with a four-point system response curve that is a function of peak reservoir stage. The data is plotted with three different transformations, linear, logarithmic, and z-variate, with peak stage along the x-axis. You can visually see that both logarithmic and z-variate do a decent job of linearization. If you fit a trend line and get the r-squared values, you'll see the z-variate does the best job, but only by a marginal amount. The R squared of 0.92 for z-variate is closer to 1 than the 0.89 for logarithmic, which means z-variate offers the better fit. Now, one of the problems with Microsoft Excel is there is no simple way to plot data on a probability scale, but it does have a preset for plotting on a logarithmic scale. Oftentimes, for something like what is seen on screen now, we will choose logarithmic out of convenience instead of z-variate even though z-variate has a slightly higher r-squared value. Doing this makes it much easier to plot the data, and the change in the overall result will be negligible. 
Next, we have another example that illustrates the importance of evaluating your data and why the interpolation method matters. We are given a simple numerical example where y equals x squared. If we were to interpolate linearly to find the value for y when x is 7, you would take your two closest data points on either side. In this example, x equals 5 and x equals 10. Draw a straight line between them and pull the value for x equals 7 from that line. Doing it this way, we calculate a y value of 55 as shown on the left. If we were to do a logarithmic transformation and do the same thing as shown on the right, we get a y value of 49. It's essentially the same formula as that on the left, but we're taking the log of the x values and then taking the antilog, or 10 raised to the power of what we just calculated to transform it back. Comparing the two methods, linear interpolation resulted in an error of 12% and logarithmic interpolation resulted in an error of 0%. The point is that the method of interpolation could matter quite a bit. One of the tools that we are going to use today and that is embedded in many of the RMC spreadsheet tools is the interpolation macro. The macro contains various user-defined functions that can transform the data and interpolate for us. Functions are available for 1D and 2D situations. For the 1D interpolation, there are eight different functions available for the different scenarios you might run into. The syntax for the formula is shown here at the bottom. You would type in the function you want to use, then within the parentheses, you would input or select the cell for the X value of interest, then cells of the X array, and the cells for the Y array of the data from which you are interpolating. The last two inputs, order and extrapolation, are optional and will be covered a couple slides from now. Functions have also been developed for 2D situations that allow the user to specify the transformations for X, Y, and Z. The transformation options are LIN or LIN for linear, LOG or log for logarithmic, and Z for Z variant. For example, if we wanted a function to interpolate linearly for X and Y and logarithmically for Z, the function would then be by lin lin log int. If we wanted the function to be log for all three variables, the function would be by log 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 int. The lone exception is when we want a straight linear interpolation for all variables. In this instance, the formula would simply be by lin int. The syntax for these functions is similar to what we discussed for the 1D functions, but with some more inputs. The first two inputs are the X and Y values of interest, which are then followed by the X array, the Y array, and the Z array of the data from which we want to interpolate. Next, we have the optional inputs for the order, ascending or descending, of the X data and the Y data, and then whether or not we want to extrapolate for X's and Y's that fall outside of our data ranges. If your data is in ascending order, you can either set the order input equal to 1 or leave it blank. If your data is in descending order, you will need to set the order input equal to minus 1, else the function will return an error. For extrapolation, no extrapolation will occur if the input is set to 0. Should the value that you are interpolating for fall outside of your data array, the function will return either the first or last value within the data array depending on which side of the data your interpolation value falls. If the extrapolation input is set equal to 1, the extrapolation will be performed using either the first two points or the last two points of the data arrays. For those not familiar with how to add a macro into Excel, you have two options. Using your tool ribbon, you can click on Developer and then Visual Basic, if developer isn't listed in the ribbon, click File, then Options, then Customize Ribbon. You can then click a checkbox to activate the Developer tab. Option two is to right-click on one of your worksheet tabs and choose View Code. Once in VBA, click on File and choose Import File. Select your macro file from the Explorer window and click Open. Once you've done that, the macro will be added under Modules.
You can then close VBA and the macro will be available in your spreadsheet. Now that we've covered everything you need to know about the macro, let's look at a couple examples. In this first example, we have a system response relationship and we want to interpolate to calculate the SRP for the peak stages shown using linear for X and long for Y. The last two stages we are evaluating are the same, but for the last one we will extrapolate. So because we want linear for X and log for Y, the function will be lin log int. The first input is the X value or peak stage of interest. We follow that up with the X array shown in the red box and the Y array in the blue box. The X data is ascending, so we will input a one for the order. For the last input, we will put a zero for the first two cells to do the calculation without extrapolation and a one for the input in the last cell for extrapolation. For a peak stage at elevation 265, which falls outside the data on the left, choosing without extrapolation returns the last Y value in the data set, 2.12 times 10 to the minus two. When extrapolation is selected, it uses the last two points to project for the higher stage, resulting in a system response probability that is a little bit higher. This next example is for 2D interpolation. We want to interpolate the hydraulic shear stress for a given crack width and headwater level and are told to use linear for X and Y and Z variate for Z. So our function will be by lin lin Z int. The first input is the crack width, which is the X value. The second is the headwater, which is the Y value. These are followed up with the X array in blue the Y array in red, and the Z array in purple. X and Y are both in ascending order, so we punch in ones for the next two inputs. In this example, whether you allow extrapolation or not, you will get the same answer. Here, extrapolation was not allowed for X or Y, so zeros were used for the last two inputs. As we have already discussed, if extrapolation is allowed, the slope between the two values at the starting boundary or ending boundary is used to extend the data. If extrapolation is not allowed and the input value is beyond the assigned range, the closest boundary value will then be used. With these two options in mind, the natural question becomes, should extrapolation be allowed? Consider the following. We have a system response curve that is initially defined by five data points. If we are using our interpolation function and do not allow extrapolation, the SRP will be set to the system response probability of the first point for all stages less than that first point. The same thing happens at the other end of the curve where the SRP for stages greater than that of the fifth point is set equal to the system response probability of the fifth point. If we allow extrapolation, the curve gets extended through the last two points at either end of the curve, and we will get the red points. If instead we were to elicit the system response probabilities for the full range of the hazard, which is defined to be the width of this box, we might have ended up with something like the black points at the ends. At the upper end, we would have overestimated if we had extrapolated, but underestimated if we had held the probability constant. At the lower end, both options would have overestimated the system response probability. The moral of the story and the point of the last example is to show that we want to avoid extrapolation when possible. We do not want to unknowingly lose perspective, nor do we want to increase the potential for unexpected results. In the previous example, although no was selected, a form of extrapolation was still performed to obtain SRP values because the full range of the hazard was not specified. It's always good practice to evaluate the system response and consequences for the full range of the hazard to facilitate consistency and checking. Also, if there is a threshold elevation for a failure mode to initiate, then define the range over which the system response probability equals zero so that it is clear what values are being used over the full range.
This brings us to the first exercise for Module 2. In this exercise, you are asked to use the interpolation macro to fill out the yellow cells in the following tables. For 2.1a, you are asked to calculate y for the given values of x using the specified interpolation routines. So we're going to do the same thing three times, but with different transformations, linear, logarithmic, and z-variate. For 2.1b, you are asked to interpolate from the table above for the given x-y pairs using a log transformation for both x and y and linear for z. Please pause the video and take a moment to work through the exercise. When you are finished, press play for the solution. The first column in the exercise asks us to do a straight linear interpolation. To do this, the function we need is lin int. The first input for the function is our x value of interest, which is the 1.26 in cell E7. Next, we input the x array, shown in the red box, cells B5 through B9, followed by the y array, cells C5 through C9, shown in the purple box. Because the data is in ascending order, we will input a 1 for the order, which is our next input, and for the last input, we will put 0 to disallow extrapolation. Dollar signs were used to lock the rows and columns of the X and Y arrays. This will allow us to drag the formula down to populate the next two rows without those arrays changing. So the only thing changing in the formula is the X value of interest. In the second row, it will be E8 in the formula, and in the third row, it will be E9. After dragging the formula down, here are the results for the first column. For the second and third columns, the transformation for the y value changes, but that's it. This means that we need to use different functions, but the inputs into the function will be the same as those for the first function that we just showed for linear interpolation. In the second column, we are asked to do a logarithmic transformation for the y variable. The function we need now becomes lin log int, linear or lin for x, and logarithmic or log for y. The inputs for the function are exactly the same as what we used for the first part. The first input is the x value of interest, followed by the x array, then the y array, a 1 for the order, and a 0 to disallow extrapolation. Lock the rows and columns using dollar signs for the x array and the y array like we did before, and we're all set. Drag the formula down and you get the value shown here for y. For the last column, we are asked to do a z-variate transformation for y. The inputs will all be the same again, but the function will change to lin z int, linear or lin for x, and z-variate or z for y. Here's the function lin z int. Input the x value, the x array, the y array, one for the order, and zero to disallow extrapolation. Add your dollar signs to lock the rows and columns for the x and y arrays. Next, we drag the formula down to populate the rest of the table. And the completed table should look like this. For the second part of the exercise, the z value is a function of two variables variables x and y. We are asked to interpolate to find z for the given x-y pairs. We are also asked to do a log transformation for both x and y when we interpolate. The 2D interpolation function needed will be by log log lin int, log for x, log for y, and linear for z. The first input will be the x value from cell B26. The second input will be the y value from C26, followed by the x array, the y array, and the z array. The x array is the purple shaded cells that range from B15 to B19. The y array is the green cells from C14 across through F14. And the z array extends from C15 to F19 in the fuchsia box. Dollar signs were added to lock the rows and columns for the arrays because the arrays do not change, only the x's and y's for which we are interpolating. 
To finish out the inputs, we need the x order, the y order, and then x extrapolation and y extrapolation. Both the x and y arrays are in ascending order, so the inputs will be ones for both. The instructions tell us not to allow extrapolation, so the next two inputs will both be zero. Drag the formula down to complete the table, and that completes the exercise. But before moving on, let's go back to exercise 2.1a for a second. We completed the interpolation three different ways using three different transformations for y, but which method is most appropriate? If we plot the results, plot some trend lines, and look at the computed r-square values, we can see that the z-variate transformation results in something closest to a straight line and would therefore be the best choice in this instance. Next, let's define the types of risk we will consider. We saw this slide back in Module 1. The figure shown is embedded in the periodic assessment and facilitators training presentations, and it is also in our dam safety and levee safety policy documents. It shows that risk is a function of the hazard, the performance, and the consequences. As we discussed back in Module 1, there are three different types of risk we will consider. Incremental risk, non-breach risk, and residual risk. In the upcoming slides, we are going to step through the general equations we use to calculate each type of risk. The incremental risk is the risk that exists due to the presence of the dam or levy. The risk can either be associated with life loss or economic cost. It is calculated by taking the product of the hazard, the performance, and the incremental consequences, and then summing them up for all hazard conditions. We're taking the probability of the hazard and multiplying it by the conditional probability of failure or system response, which is the probability of failure given the same flood or earthquake considered in the first term. The product of these first two terms is the annual probability of failure, or APF. To get the risk, we then multiply by the associated incremental consequences of failure. Incremental consequences are equal to the difference between the consequences associated with a breach, component malfunction, or improper operation, and those without. For the incremental risk, we're only considering the increase in consequences to calculate the risk associated with the dam or levy not performing as intended. Non-breach risk is the risk associated with intended dam operation or overtopping without breach. Although the dam or levy may function as intended, the population in the reservoir area and downstream of the dam or in the levied area are at risk due to non-breach flooding. Because we are considering the intended operation, there is no term for dam or levy performance. We are assuming that it performs as intended, so that term becomes one. This makes the non-breach risk a function of the hazard and the non-breach consequences. We'll multiply those two terms together and then sum them up over all hazard intervals to get the non-breach risk. To distinguish the non-breach average annual life loss and the average annual economic costs from that of the incremental, we'll use a subscript NB at the end of each term. Lastly, the residual risk is the risk of inundation at any time. Inundation can occur whether the dam or levy performs as intended or not. So the residual risk is equal to the sum of the incremental risk and the non-breach risk. Before diving into the details of all the different calculations done during a risk assessment, I'm going to introduce the typical plots we use to portray risk and discuss some of the guidelines the Corps uses when assessing tolerability. Let's start with the little fn plot. The little fn plot is the most used and one of the easier portrayals to understand. It is one of the primary considerations used when assigning dam and levy safety action classifications. The x-axis is the average incremental life loss, n bar, and the y-axis is the annual probability of failure. The diagonal lines, which are the product of the APF and N bar, show the average annual life loss. On this plot, we will plot the marginal or unadjusted risk of each potential failure mode 
and then the total project risk. The reason we adjust failure modes is to avoid errors such as double counting when we combine them, so the adjustment only impacts the total project risk. In this example, the highest risk failure mode is PFM2B, even though it has the lowest APF of the plotted failure modes. The risk is represented by the diagonal lines as it is the combination of both probability and consequences. Risks are unacceptable when the average annual life loss is greater than or equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 3, except in extraordinary circumstances. For levies, things are a little different. The average annual life loss must either be at least an order of magnitude less than the average annual non-breach life loss, or be below the standard average annual life loss guideline of 1 times 10 to the minus 3 lives per year, whichever is higher. Risks that plot in the bottom right-hand portion of the plot with an annual probability of failure less than 1 times 10 to the minus 6 and life loss greater than 1,000 are referred to as low probability, high consequence events. Estimated risks that plot within this region deserve special scrutiny during the decision-making process because of the magnitude of the expected consequences. We will talk more about this later. Next, we have the big FN plot and the big F dollar plot. These are probably the least understood of all the required plots that are used. The big FN plot displays a probability distribution of incremental life loss from all failure modes and all population exposure scenarios for all inundation scenarios associated with incremental risk. This curve is like the flood hazard curve or the seismic hazard curve but with the axes flipped so that the probabilities are on the y-axis. You can think of this plot as a frequency curve for consequences. The big FN plot is essentially a complementary cumulative distribution function. The only difference is it shows the probability of being greater than or equal to a given life loss. This plot answers the question, what is the annual probability F of incremental life loss greater than or equal to N? To use it, pick your incremental life loss magnitude of interest. Draw a line straight up until you reach the curve, then draw a horizontal line to the y-axis to get the annual probability of having at least that number of fatalities. For this example, the estimated annual probability of 300 or more fatalities due to dam failure is about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Both the little fn plot and the big fn plot have a region in the bottom right hand corner for low probability and high consequence events. Estimated risks that plot within this region deserve special scrutiny during the decision making process because of the magnitude of the expected consequences. When estimating probabilities, there is a lower bound beyond which the reliability of the estimates becomes questionable. There's also a threshold beyond which the magnitude of consequences necessitates extraordinary measures to control risk. Because of this, it is appropriate to treat low probability and high consequence situations with great care and closer scrutiny to ensure everything reasonable has been done to reduce risks. This region is defined by life loss, average incremental for the little fn plot, and just incremental for the big fn plot that is greater than or equal to a thousand and an annual probability of failure less than or equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 6. We also have a plot for the individual most at risk. The individual life risk is represented by the probability of life loss for the identifiable person or group by location that is most at risk of life loss due to a dam or a levee breach. It is influenced by a person's location, exposure, and vulnerability within a breach inundation area. The individual risk is calculated as the annual probability of failure times the likelihood of the most exposed person or group losing their life. The second term in the equation will be provided by the consequence specialist. The individual life risk limit is 1 times 10 to the minus 4. The individual risk will always be less than or equal to the annual probability of failure. So if the APF is less than 1 times 10 to the minus 4, then the individual risk will also be less than 1 times 10 to the minus 4 and below the limit. From here, I'm going to step through all the different calculations, starting with the incremental risk. 
We covered this earlier, but here's the incremental risk equation one more time. We're going to start with the calculation for the annual probability of failure, or APF, which is the product of the hazard probability and the system response. There are a couple tabs on the Module 2 Exercises and Homework Spreadsheet titled Presentation Example and Presentation Example Solution. These can be used as a companion to this presentation. It is recommended that you use these worksheets to follow along and work through the example calculations as I demonstrate them. Here are the steps for calculating the annual probability of failure. To calculate the marginal annual probability of failure of a potential failure mode, we'll start by discretizing the hazard into intervals. We will calculate the probability of each hazard interval and then multiply the system response at the midpoint of each hazard interval by its corresponding hazard interval probability. Lastly, we'll sum the result for all the hazard intervals, which will give us the annual probability of failure. When we calculate the total risk, as we discussed in Module 1, we need to combine the PFM risk estimates in a way that is technically correct so that we do not artificially inflate the risk. So to calculate the contribution of each PFM to the total risk, we will follow the same procedure as for calculating the marginal APF, but we will select a risk model, such as competing risk, to adjust the system response probabilities. And we will then use those adjusted system response probabilities instead of the marginal system response probabilities in the calculation. The first step is to discretize the hazard into intervals. Discretizing is just a fancy word for splitting or partitioning. When we split up the hazard into intervals, we want these intervals to encompass the full range of the hazard. These hazard intervals do not need to be even, but that is typically where we start. When the system response probabilities or consequences are sensitive to small changes in the hazard, smaller intervals around those critical loads will provide better precision and yield more accurate results. Your other option would be to increase the overall number of partitions, which will lead to smaller intervals and better resolution. Because we are working with annual exceedance probabilities, the probability that a given hazard will be met or exceeded each year, the probability of being within a given hazard interval is going to be equal to the difference in the exceedance probabilities of the hazards that define the interval. We should include both non-exceedance and exceedance within our intervals. In a stage frequency curve, the first peak stage of the curve will have an exceedance probability that is close to one, but less than one. From module one of the course, we learned that the sum of the probabilities originating from a single chance node must be collectively exhaustive and sum to one. To satisfy this rule, we need to add in the small probability of having a peak stage less than the first stage of the curve. This is the non-exceedance probability. In the plot on the screen, the first stage of the curve has an annual exceedance probability of 0.99, which means there's a 99% chance that the stage will be exceeded each year. It also means there's a 1% chance that it will not be exceeded. To account for this 1% and to make everything sum up to 1 and satisfy our event tree rules, we're going to add this non-exceedance probability to the probability we calculate for our first stage interval. A couple things on partitioning. The partitions do not have to match the hazard values that are given. In this example, the black points here define the stage frequency curve, but we can pick our intervals between those points and simply interpolate to get the annual exceedance probability for the stage that we have selected to define the interval. Also, to reiterate what I've covered on the previous slide, because the probabilities given for each stage are exceedance probabilities, we need to subtract the probabilities of the stages that define the interval to calculate the probability of having a peak stage that falls within that interval. In the example, stage one is exceeded 99% of the time. In stage two, it's exceeded 90% of the time. Therefore, the probability that a peak stage falls between stage one and stage two is equal to 9% each year, or 99% minus 90%.
The table on this slide illustrates the discretization process and how to calculate the probability for each partition or interval. The table shows how to account for non-exceedance and exceedance probabilities. The non-exceedance probability, as we just discussed, is added to the probability of the first interval. The exceedance probability is accounted for in the last interval and is simply the probability of exceeding the last hazard used to define the hazard curve. The hazard may be bounded by a state variable, like stage, but unbounded by probability. For example, if we bound the stage frequency curve at the probable maximum flood, the stage frequency curve would go horizontal upon reaching the probable maximum flood and stay that way forever because the zero cannot be plotted on a probability scale. Essentially, we would be limiting the hazard range that we are considering so that the last interval, interval n, would be removed from the calculations because we are saying that we cannot exceed that stage. The formulas for discretizing into even intervals are provided at the bottom of the slide. The default for tools like RMC QRA calcs and RMC total risk is to use even intervals. But like I said earlier in this presentation, if you're going to use even intervals, you need to make sure you use enough of them to account for inflection points in the hazard curve, the system response, and the consequences. Also, when we say even intervals, we mean all but one even interval because the last interval will be for the exceedance probability. So for n equals 10, we will end up with 10 total intervals, nine that are evenly spaced, and then one interval for the exceedance. Here is where you will want to start using the Module 2 example spreadsheet that I mentioned earlier to help you follow along. We were given a stage frequency curve with the data shown in the table on the left. On the plot to the right, the black diamonds correspond to the stage annual exceedance probability, or AEP, points that are shown in the table. We are going to discretize into even intervals. The red triangles are the stages that split the curve into 10 even partitions. For a given interval, the probability of reaching a peak stage within that interval is equal to the annual exceedance probability of the interval's lowest stage minus the annual exceedance probability of the interval's highest stage. So for the second interval between peak stages A1 and A2, the probability of that interval will be equal to the annual exceedance probability of A1 minus the annual exceedance probability of A2. You can see here that the non-exceedance probability, one minus the annual exceedance probability of the first stage, is at the bottom of the plot. This should be added to the first interval. Here are the interpolated annual exceedance probabilities for the stages that define our partitions. The probability for each interval is calculated by taking the annual exceedance probability at the lower stage minus the annual exceedance probability of the highest stage. The probabilities are the same ones shown in red on the prior slide that we interpolated from the stage frequency curve. The non-exceedance is added into the first partition, and if everything is done correctly, all these probabilities will sum to 1. When we are calculating risk, we are essentially calculating the area under a consequence frequency curve that is derived from the hazard, the system response probabilities, and the consequences using the trapezoidal rule. The discretization or partitioning gives us the trapezoids. This is also essentially what we are doing with the event tree calculations. We develop a branch for each hazard partition, assign the system response probability and life loss that best represents the interval, and then the frequency or the Y value of the trapezoid will be the product of the hazard probability times the system response, and the X value will be the change in the consequences. We can then multiply X and Y for each trapezoid to get each area and then sum them up to get a good approximation of the area under the curve. With regards to the number of intervals that we need, it's good practice to use at least 50 intervals, but this is arbitrary. The key is to have enough intervals, evenly spaced or not, to adequately account for the inflection points in the input curves. This brings us to our second exercise of the module, discretization. For this exercise, you were given a stage frequency relationship and asked to discretize into 10 even intervals 
and then to calculate the hazard probability for each interval. The instructions also say to include non-exceedance. Please pause the video and complete the exercise, then resume when you are finished. To linearly discretize into even intervals, we're going to use the equation from an earlier slide, which I've repeated at the bottom of this slide. n is set equal to 10 and is the number of intervals. For the upper stage of the first interval, we're going to take the lower stage in cell E10, elevation 725.8, and add to it the difference of our greatest peak stage, elevation 773.4, and our lowest peak stage, elevation 725.8, all divided by n minus 1, which for an n of 10 equals 9. We'll use the dollar signs to lock the row and column of these cells in the numerator because they are constants and will stay the same for the subsequent intervals. For the next interval, we will pick up where the other interval left off, so we will set cell E11 equal to the elevation we just calculated in cell F10. From there, we can drag the formulas down in columns E and F to complete these columns of the table. Now that we have discretized the full range of the hazard in the 10 intervals, let's calculate the probability of each interval. We are going to interpolate using the Excel interpolation macro discussed at the beginning of this presentation. Because stage frequency is plotted on a probability scale, we will use z-variate interpolation. In the first interval, because we are including non-exceedance, the first term is 1, and we subtract from it the annual exceedance probability of the upper interval. The equation I use here is the same as that shown to the right, but with the terms reduced. It is equal to the annual exceedance probability of the lower stage minus the annual exceedance probability of the upper stage plus the non-exceedance, which equals one minus the annual exceedance probability of the lower stage. The probability of the first hazard interval is going to be 4.88 times 10 to the minus one. For the other intervals, the procedure is similar. Use z-varied interpolation to calculate the annual exceedance probability for stage one interpolate again to calculate the annual exceedance probability for stage two, and then subtract it from the stage one annual exceedance probability. Remember to use the dollar signs for the peak stage array and the annual exceedance probability array, and then you can drag that formula down and complete all but the last cell of the table. Dragging the formula down, we get these probabilities. The final interval is our exceedance probability, which in this case is a probability of having a stage greater than elevation 773.4. You can interpolate like I have done here, or the easiest thing would be to just set the probability equal to the annual exceedance probability for elevation 773.4 directly from the table, which is an annual exceedance probability of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5. So that completes our table. As a check, it is always a good idea to make sure these probabilities all sum to one. And here they do, so we know that we are in good shape. Now, back to the presentation example we started earlier. We'll move into potential failure modes and their associated system response probabilities. We will step through the calculations for PFM1, concentrated leak erosion along the conduit. The calculations for the backward erosion piping failure modes, PFM2A and PFM2B, are included in the companion spreadsheet, but will not be covered in detail in the presentation, because the calculation procedure is the same as that for PFM1. So, with the stage frequency curve discretized and probabilities calculated for each interval, the next step is to calculate the system response probabilities for each interval. When we develop our system response curve, we need to evaluate enough stages to cover the full range of the hazard. Possible inflection points can be related to performance observations, changes in geometry or geology, 
in hydraulic conditions, like top of active storage, above which tailwater may increase. Also, it's always good to define your system response probabilities, at least up to top of dam, not just the probable maximum flood, because as data and methodology change and improve, that probable maximum flood elevation might also change. The system response probabilities, at least for this failure mode, are estimated as a function of peak stage. For calculating the annual probability of failure, we will need the system response probabilities at the midpoint of each of the hazard intervals that we created earlier. For each interval, we're going to take the midpoint, which is the average stage for that interval, and then we're going to interpolate from the system response curve to get the probabilities. Here, a logarithmic transformation was used when interpolating to get the system response probabilities. C variate would have been marginally better at linearization, but not enough to make a meaningful difference. So let's use logarithmic interpolation because it's much easier to plot in Microsoft Excel. Just to reiterate, we take the midpoint stage of each hazard interval and interpolate to find the system response probability for that midpoint stage. Now that we have hazard probabilities and system response probabilities for each hazard interval, we can calculate the annual probability of failure. This is done by multiplying the hazard probability by the system response probability in each hazard interval, then summing those products together. In this example, the annual probability of failure turns out to be 5.07 times 10 to the minus 4. Calculating the annual probability of failure was the first part, but it's not risk until we consider consequences. Next, we will calculate the average annual life loss and the average incremental life loss. To do this, we start with the calculation for incremental life loss, and like the system response probabilities, we will do this for the midpoint of each hazard interval. It will be done for each exposure scenario as well. Exposure is a fraction of a period of time for which a life loss estimate applies. Typically, we only consider day and night for exposure, but as discussed in Module 1, other scenarios can be considered as well and should be considered when they might impact the risk estimate. To calculate the average annual life loss, we're going to multiply the annual probability of failure by the exposure and incremental life loss, then sum the results to obtain the average annual life loss. After we calculate the average annual life loss, we will divide that value by the total annual probability of failure to calculate n bar, the average incremental life loss. n bar is the average number of fatalities that is expected should the dam or levy fail, considering all possible hazard and exposure scenarios. Continuing with the example that we've been working through, we will start with a breach life loss table shown on the left. Like we did for the system response, we are going to interpolate to find the breach life loss for the midpoint stage of each hazard range. We will do this for both the day and night exposure scenarios, and we will use linear interpolation. For the last interval, where we are considering exceedance, these are stages greater than elevation 911.8. It's not really the midpoint, but we will interpolate and use a breach life loss for elevation 911.8. Next, we will use the same procedure and interpolate to get the non-breach life loss at the midpoint of each hazard interval. The incremental life loss is the difference between the breach life loss and the non-breach life loss. For each exposure scenario of each hazard interval, subtract the non-breach life loss from the breach life loss to get the incremental life loss. For the second to last interval, elevation 901.3 to elevation 911.8, the math is shown. For the day exposure, the incremental life loss is equal to 495 minus 18, which equals 477, as shown in red. And for the night exposure, which is shown in green, it is 438 minus 21, which gives us 417. Now that we have the incremental life loss, the last thing we need to calculate the average annual life loss is the exposure. We are told to assume a 10 hour workday. So we will simply divide those 10 hours by 24, the number of hours in a day, 
to get the day exposure of 0.417. The night exposure will be the complement, 1 minus 0.417, which equals 0.583. For the night exposure, you could have also taken the 14 remaining hours and simply divided by 24, which also equals 0.583. Next, we multiply the day exposure by the day incremental life loss and add that to the product of the night exposure and the night incremental life loss to get the weighted incremental life loss. Finally, we sum the average annual life loss calculated for each interval and get a total average annual life loss of 1.29 times 10 to the minus 2 lives per year. Often, we will not report the exposure weighted life loss and do the exposure weighting within the average annual life loss calculation, as shown by the equation at the bottom of the slide. Finally, we will take the average annual life loss that we just calculated and divide it by the annual probability of failure to get n bar, the average incremental life loss. The average annual life loss is 1.29 times 10 to the minus 2, and we'll divide that by the annual probability of failure, which is 5.07 times 10 to the minus 4. That gives us an n bar, which is equal to 25 lives per failure. This completes the marginal risk calculations for PFM1. We would then complete the same set of calculations for the remaining failure modes, PFM2A and PFM2B. The calculations for those failure modes are included in the companion spreadsheet. That brings us to exercise number three for this module, where you're going to practice calculating the annual probability of failure, the average annual life loss, and the average incremental life loss. In the exercise, you're given the system response, which you're going to interpolate from using semi-logarithmic interpolation. You're also given the non-breach life loss and the breach life loss. We are going to use the same stage frequency curve and hazard intervals from the previous exercise, so that part of the table is already populated for you. Your task is to calculate the annual probability of failure, the average annual life loss, and the average incremental life loss. Please pause the video and take all the time you need to work through things, and then restart the video once you've completed the exercise. The first step is to interpolate to calculate the system response probability for the midpoint of each hazard interval. To get the midpoint, we will take the average of the lower and upper stage that define the interval. We're instructed to use semi-log interpolation with linear for stage and logarithmic transformation for the system response. So when we use the linlog int function from our Excel macro, the first input is the midpoint of the hazard interval, which is equal to the average of the two stages. Next is the X array, which is the peak stage column from our system response table. And then the Y array is the system response probabilities from that same table. The data is in ascending order, so the input for order will be 1, and we do not want to extrapolate, so the input for extrapolation will be 0. Use dollar signs to lock the row and columns for the X array and the Y array, so we can drag the formulas down to finish out the column. When we do that, we get these values for the system response probabilities. Next, we will multiply the hazard probability by the system response probability. So that's E32 times cell F32. And then we can drag that formula all the way down to get the APF for each interval. The exercise instructions tell us to assume a 10 hour workday, so our day exposure will be 10 divided by 24, the number of hours in a day. Likewise, for the night exposure, it'll be 14 divided by 24, or you could have taken one minus the day exposure. We get a day exposure of 0.417 and the night exposure of 0.583. The exposure weights will be the same for all intervals, so we can drag the formulas for those cells down to the bottom of the table.
Next, we need to calculate our incremental life loss for the midpoint of each hazard interval. The incremental life loss is equal to the breach life loss minus the non-breach life loss. And we will do this for each exposure using linear interpolation. Starting with the day life loss, the first part of the formula is for the daytime breach life loss. The average of cells B32 and C32 are the midpoint of the interval, and our X and Y arrays come from the breach life loss table as shown. From that, we subtract the non-breach life loss. The non-breach formula is pretty much the same, but with the X and Y arrays coming from the non-breach life loss table. Dollar signs were used to lock the rows and columns of the X and Y arrays on both sides of the equation. So we can later drag and drop the formulas down to fill out the table. For the first interval, the daytime incremental life loss should come out to be 11. We will repeat the step we just did, but for the night exposure. The only part of the formula that changes from before is the Y array. The column changes from G and C for breach and non-breach over to H and D to reference the night data instead of the day. The quickest way to do this is to copy and paste the equation we had from the day before, then click in the formula bar, click the edge of the rectangle at the top, and drag the rectangle over from the day column to the night column. For the first interval, the nighttime incremental life loss is 19. Then we can drag those formulas down to compute the incremental life loss for the rest of the intervals. To calculate the average annual life loss at each interval, we first need the exposure weighted life loss. So we will multiply the day exposure by the day life loss and multiply the night exposure by the night life loss and then sum those products together. We can drag that formula down to complete the column. We will then multiply the APF by the exposure weighted incremental life loss to compute the average annual life loss. Drag that formula down to complete the upper table. From here, we sum the APF over each interval to get the total APF. Then sum the average annual life losses for each interval to get the total average annual life loss. Then divide the total average annual life loss by the total annual probability of failure to get n bar. When all is said and done, we calculate the APF to be 1.43 times 10 to the minus 6, the average annual life loss to be 1.03 times 10 to the minus 4, and n bar to be 72. Similar to how we calculated the average annual life loss in N bar, we can calculate the average annual economic cost, AAEC, and the average incremental economic cost, dollar bar. The process and the equations are the same, but we do these calculations with dollars now instead of life loss. So far, the example covered up to this point has been for a single failure mode. What do we do when we have multiple failure modes? In module one, we discuss combining failure modes, and this is something that is worth reiterating so that we can be sure that we are combining the failure mode risk estimates in a way that is technically correct. We do not want to artificially inflate the risk by how we combine failure modes, and we need to be aware of the breach characteristics of each failure mode. There are several options available for combining risk. The joint risk model is the most accurate, but is also the most computationally intensive. For the common cause adjustment, intersection events are weighted and distributed by potential failure mode. In the competing risk model, it is assumed that the first failure precludes additional failures or additional consequences. And in the exclusive risk model, dependence among potential failure modes is assumed to be negligible with respect to both probability and consequences such that the estimates can be summed. As discussed in Module 1, which model to use depends on the tools available and the accuracy required. Common cause adjustment has been the most frequently used risk model for dam safety risk assessments, but the Corps now recommends using joint risk or competing risk.
not discussed in Module 1, is what to do when the same failure mechanism is evaluated for multiple pathways. When multiple failure paths of the same mechanism in the same area are evaluated due to physical differences in geology, geometry, treatment, or whatever, we will combine the system response curves into a single composite curve by selecting the maximum probability of failure at each hazard interval if the expected breach characteristics and downstream consequences are the same. The composite system response relationship for the failure mechanism would then be combined with the project's other system response curves per the selected model. Here's a figure showing some examples of cross sections where different flow paths would need to be evaluated for the same cross section. You will want to consider flow passing above and below the core, above and below incline drains and filters, and above and below stability berms. To combine the risk estimates for different flow paths of a cross section, we will take the maximum system response probabilities between the flow paths for a given hazard. Getting back to our example, we have three potential failure modes and we will be using the competing risk model. PFM1 is concentrated leak erosion. PFM2A and PFM2B are both the same mechanism, backward erosion piping, and have the same consequences. So we will need to combine them into a single composite system response by taking the maximum at each hazard interval before adjusting the probabilities using the competing risk model. Here we have the marginal system response probabilities for the potential failure modes, and we are told to use the competing risk model. PFM2A and 2B are the same failure mechanism evaluated at different locations. So prior to performing the competing risk calculations, we must first identify the maximum probability between PFM2A and PFM2B at each hazard interval. As shown, the system response for PFM2A is highest for the first seven intervals, and PFM2B is the highest for the remaining intervals. The maximum system response probabilities are carried forward as the combined system response for PFM2. Competing risk calculations were discussed in the Module 1 presentation. The results are shown in this table and an example calculation is provided. Please refer to Module 1 if you need a refresher on competing risk. You will need to know how to do the competing risk calculations for Homework 2. To then calculate the total project risk, we will need to complete the event tree math and sum the failure end nodes to calculate the total APF using the adjusted system response probabilities we just calculated. We will multiply the APF by N for each hazard interval or event tree branch at each failure mode and sum them all up to calculate the average annual life loss. We will divide the average annual life loss by the APF to get N bar. Lastly, we will do the same thing for the economic risk and multiply the APF by the dollar amount for each hazard interval or event tree branch of each failure mode, and then sum them up to calculate the average annual economic cost. For our simple example, after adjusting the system response of each failure mode using the competing risk model, the total project APF becomes a simple sum of the APFs calculated for each failure mode. APF1 plus APF2. The same goes for the average annual life loss and average annual economic cost. The non-breach part of the tree goes to zero because there are no incremental consequences for the non-breach scenario. Having completed the incremental risk calculations, there are a variety of ways we can present the results. We've already discussed the little FN plot the big FN and F dollar plots, and the individual risk plot. In addition to these plots, we can also create risk profile plots to show how the APF, average annual life loss, or average annual economic cost changes with an increase in hazard. Here is how the risk from our example plots on the little FN chart. Remember that the marginal risk for each PFM is plotted along with the total. The competing risk model adjustment is only used to compute the contribution to the total. The total plots more than an order of magnitude above the average annual life loss guideline, and risk reduction would very likely be recommended unless there are exceptional circumstances.
The qualifier, unless there are exceptional circumstances, refers to a situation in which the government, acting on behalf of society, may determine that risks exceeding the tolerable risk limits may be tolerated based on special benefits that the dam brings to society at large. For risk profile or cumulative plots, we will calculate the cumulative APF starting with the lowest hazard interval and working up towards the highest peak stage. When we finish, the APF at the last stage should be equal to the total APF of the potential failure mode. The results are plotted stepwise. The plot makes it easy to see which hazard interval contributes most significantly to the overall APF of the potential failure mode. In this example, you can see how the steps get smaller and smaller as the stage increases, illustrating that these stages are contributing less and less to the overall total risk. About 90% of the risk here is coming from stages below elevation 880, and over 70% of the risk is coming from stages below elevation 870. Technically, this plot is supposed to be plotted in stepwise fashion, but that can be a bit of a hassle. If you have enough partitions, you can just plot the cumulative APF versus the midpoint of the hazard intervals. It will communicate essentially the same information, but it's much easier to create. We can create these plots for annual probability of failure, average annual life loss, and average annual economic cost. We can create them for individual failure modes, like on the previous slide, where we use the unadjusted system response and we can create them for the total project risk where we use the adjusted system response to get the potential failure modes contribution to the total as shown here. For each stage interval, we sum the probabilities from each failure mode to get the total for the stage. Then the cumulative is equal to the total APF from that interval plus the sum of the APFs for all lower intervals. Once complete, it will look like this, with stepwise functions for the individual potential failure modes, shown in red, blue, and green, along with the total, shown in black. Next, here is how our example plots on the big FN plot. As you can see, the risk exceeds the guideline. Remember that this plot displays a probability distribution of incremental life loss. The probability of at least 10 or more fatalities is a little bit under 1 in 1,000, and the probability of at least 100 fatalities is just under 1 in 10,000. There are a handful of steps to make the big FN plot. To start, we are going to multiply the APF, calculated using the adjusted system response probability, by the exposure for each partition of each potential failure mode. The table to the right is a zoomed-in version of the table on the left, which was generated as part of the example we've been working through this entire module. Here, we see the portion of the table for PFM1. We have the APF for each interval. We multiply that by the day exposure in the top half of the table and by the night exposure in the bottom half of the table to get our probability F. Each of these scenarios has an associated incremental life loss. Remember the incremental n values we calculated earlier? Those are the same day and night values here that we will use to create what we will call our fn pairs, tying each probability to a life loss. We need all possible fn pairs across all exposures, partitions, and potential failure modes. Once I have all those pairs, I'm going to merge them into one big table and then sort them by the incremental life loss n. All the pairs from all potential failure modes and exposures are in this table. When we sort them, we want to sort them high to low. From these sorted FN pairs, we will calculate the big F, the cumulative probability, for each N by summing the little Fs for that N and higher Ns, much like we did when developing the cumulative risk profile plots earlier. For the first partition, the little F is going to be equal to the big F and is equal to 6.44 times 10 to the minus 8. I add 1.58 times 10 to the minus 6 and get 1.64 times 10 to the minus 6 for the next interval. I add 2.14 times 10 to the minus 7 to that and get 1.86 times 10 to the minus 6 for the next one. And I'll continue that process until I reach the very bottom of the table. 
When finished, the cumulative probability, the big F for the lowest N, should be equal to the annual probability of failure for the project. So to reiterate, merge the FN pairs in one big list, sort high to low by N, then sum the partitions as you move down the table to calculate the cumulative probability. The last step is to plot the data stepwise. The first cumulative probability is plotted with the first two ends. The second cumulative probability is plotted with the second and third ends, and so on and so forth. Once finished, extend the rightmost end of the curve straight down to the x-axis and the leftmost end over to the y-axis. The curve extends infinitely downward and represents the maximum incremental life loss. The curve is also extended to the left because there is no discrete point for n equals zero because of the logarithmic scale. To calculate the individual risk, we simply multiply the likelihood of the most exposed person or group losing their life, as informed by LifeSim and our consequence specialists, by the annual probability of failure. In this example, we multiply 0.45 by 1.23 times 10 to the minus 3 to get an individual risk of 5.55 times 10 to the minus 4. That covers incremental risk. On to non-breach risk. If you remember from earlier, the equation is like the incremental risk equation, but the system response is no longer present in the equation. The non-breach risk is the risk associated with intended dam operation, or overtopping without breach, and is equal to the probability of the hazard times the non-breach consequences summed up over the full range of hazard. Here is the non-breach calculation using the project event tree. The non-breach scenario assumes 100% reliability and in intended operation, so all failure mode system response probabilities are set to zero. Next, I will run through a quick example. I've already covered how to partition hazard curves into intervals when calculating the incremental risk, and we'll do it the same way for the non-breach risk. The partitions we develop should be the same across all types of risk that we calculate. For each hazard interval, we will interpolate from the non-breach life loss table to get the non-breach life loss for the midpoint of each hazard interval, and we will do that for each exposure scenario being considered. Once we've done that, we'll multiply the day exposure by the day non-breach life loss and add it to the product of the night exposure and the night non-breach life loss to get the weighted non-breach life loss. Multiplying the exposure weighted non-breach life loss by the hazard probability and then summing across all intervals gives us 6.21 times 10 to the minus three lives per year for the non-breach risk. We can also calculate the non-breach average annual economic cost. This is done using the same steps as we did for the average annual life loss, but using dollars and cents instead of life loss. We typically present the non-breach risk on the big FN plot and the F dollar plots, and cumulatively versus the hazard for average annual life loss and average annual economic cost. The non-breach risk big FN plot is constructed the same way as the incremental FN plot. But for the FN pairs, F is the hazard probability multiplied by the exposure, and N is the non-breach life loss. The gray dashed line shown does not have the same meaning as the societal tolerable risk limit on the big FN plot. It is used as a reference line to allow easy comparison between the non-breach risk and the incremental life safety risk. There are no life safety risk guidelines for the non-breach risk. I find it most illustrative to plot the incremental risk and the non-breach risk on the same plot, along with the residual risk, which I will cover next. Residual risk. The residual risk is the risk of inundation at any time, 
Inundation can occur whether the dam or levee performs as intended or not. So the residual risk is equal to the sum of the incremental risk and the non-breach risk. For the residual risk, the project of entry calculations look like this. Instead of the incremental consequences, we will use the breach consequences for the failure modes and the non-breach consequences for the no-fail scenario. The no-fail probability will be equal to 1 minus the sum of all the failure modes adjusted system response probabilities. To prove that what we saw on the last slide for the residual risk will in fact be equal to the incremental risk plus the non-breach risk, I'm going to go through a little bit of algebra to expand and reorder the terms. Splitting these terms out, the incremental risk is equal to the probability of the hazard times the system response, and the incremental consequence is shown in red, and the non-breach risk is equal to the probability of the hazard times the non-breach consequences. The incremental consequences is equal to the breach consequences minus the non-breach consequences as shown in green. Expanding the terms by multiplying it all out gives me the next line. I can then factor out the probability of the hazard times the non-breach consequences from the last two terms. Once I have done that and I rearrange the terms one more time, you can see how the residual risk is equal to the APF times the breach consequences, the total breach consequences, not the incremental, plus the non-breach complement, the probability of the hazard times one minus the system response times the non-breach consequences, just like we saw on the prior slide. When I go to construct the big FN chart for the residual risk, there will be a set of FN pairs for total breach consequences, and there will be a set of pairs for the non-breach consequences. Like the non-breach risk, we typically present residual risk on the big FN plot and F dollar plot and cumulatively with the hazard versus the average annual life loss and the average annual economic cost. Remember that I said we would have two sets of FN pairs when we developed a big FN chart. We will start with the failure or breach set. Multiply the APF and the exposure to get F and pair them with the total breach life loss to get the first set of FN pairs. Again, this is a total breach life loss, not the incremental life loss for this plot. The first set of FN pairs is shown on the table on the left. Next, we need the FN pairs for the non-breach complement. To get the non-breach complement, we will subtract the APF sum for all PFMs at a given interval, as shown in red, from the hazard probability to get the probability shown in blue. F will be the difference multiplied by the exposure shown in green, and that product will pair with the associated non-breach life loss to get the FN pairs for the non-breach complement. Then, once we have both sets of FN pairs, we're going to merge them together into one list and sort them from high to low for N. We will then calculate the cumulative probability the same way we did for the incremental and non-breach big FN plots. The cumulative probability must sum to 1 for the last n value for the residual risk, although it will likely plot beyond the typical plot extents. Lastly, we plot everything stepwise. We extend the top of the curve to the left all the way down to the y-axis and extend the bottom of the curve down to the x-axis. It can be very illustrative to plot the incremental, the non-breach, and the residual risk all in the same plot to show a complete portrayal of the risk. While not the case for this example, there can be times when the non-breach risk results in a significant percentage of the residual risk. In such a scenario, spending money to lower the incremental risk may not be a wise decision because it will have minimal impact on the overall flood risk. This is why when assessing levy risk tolerability, the incremental risk is compared to the non-breach risk in addition to the CORE's guidelines. The last calculation we'll cover, which is strictly for levy risk assessments, is the annual probability of inundation. The annual probability of inundation is the total annual probability that a levied area will be inundated. 
due to levy breach prior to overtopping, component malfunction or improper operation, or overtopping without breach, and is used when evaluating National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, accreditation. Because it already includes overtopping without breach, breach by overtopping must be excluded from the calculations to avoid double counting. So the annual probability of inundation of the levied area becomes the annual probability of failure for all prior to overtopping potential failure modes, plus the annual exceedance probability of overtopping. It is an approximation because the calculations do not consider interior drainage. Later in this course, we will fully discuss the course NFIP accreditation process. This concludes Module 2 of the course. Be sure to complete Homework 2 to get credit for completing the module. In Homework 2, you are given a stage frequency relationship, some sets of breach and non-breach life loss consequences, and system response probabilities for four internal erosion failure modes. Although it is not shown on the screen, you are also given the project event tree. You are asked to calculate the risk and to generate the little fn and big fn plots. You are asked to use 10 even intervals to include non-exceedance and to use semi-logarithmic interpolation for the system response. Also, for exposure, you will want to use 11 hours for daytime exposure. Once complete, please send your completed homework to rmctraining at usace.army.mil with the subject as DLS-105 Homework 2 to help us keep track of the submittals. Thanks in advance for your cooperation. If you have trouble with the homework, please reach out through the email address on the screen. We will go over the solution to the homework assignment during the live question and answer portion, which will be in a few weeks. Also, at the end of the live session, you will be asked to take a short quiz so we can give you credit for your participation. If you missed the live session, a recording will be posted to the RMC website. Please check the course schedule for dates and times. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you back again in a few weeks.